Hello, everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the IHS Market Technology Group webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. Today's webinar is SD-WAN in a Multi-Cloud World. Enterprises are finding it necessary to rethink their WAN architectures as they build their multi-clouds and increase adoption of IoT and SaaS. So our panel will explore how SD-WAN provides connectivity for high-performance applications, the multi-cloud, and enterprise edge. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS Market and our partner, GTT. So before we get started, I want to highlight some of the features available for you on the webinar and how you can make the most of your experience today. So the webinar console that you're looking at is completely customizable. So you can open, close, move, or resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console exactly as you like. Now, at the bottom of your console, you're going to see a number of application widgets, which contain additional features that are available for you. One button I do want to mention is the resource list of widgets, and this is where you will find additional material about our topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session, as well as other valuable resources, including a special report authored by our own analyst, Cliff Grossner. And we do want to make this an interactive session, as always. So you're going to see a Twitter widget at the bottom of your screen. And this means you'll be able to tweet directly from the console. And today we're using the hashtag SDWAN. We will also have a live Q&A session after our presentation. Close. Please make sure you submit your questions or comments at any time by using that Q&A box on the left side of your screen. And if you do encounter any technical issues, there's a little question mark widget. Just click on that, and you will get the answers that you need. So now let me take this opportunity to introduce to you our panel. So first, leading our discussion is Dr. Clifford Grossner. Cliff is Executive Director, Research and Analysis in the Cloud and Data Center Research Practice segment at IHS Market. And rounding out our panel, we have Mike Rivers. Mike is Product Management Director of Managed Services at GTT. So welcome to both Cliff and Mike. It's great to have you with us. So uh, Cliff, let's get started with our presentation. So I will now turn the controls over to you. Well, thank you, Alan, and let me take a second to welcome the audience. Thanks for taking time out from what is usually a very busy day for everyone. And I, I believe we have a rich set of content that everyone hopefully will learn something from today's presentation. I'm going to kick it off with a short discussion sharing some of our research. Uh, we do a lot of primary research here at IHS Market that uh, focuses on cloud services, and we've been following the SD-WAN market for many years now. And I want to talk a little bit about the multi-cloud, in case that's something you haven't heard before about, a little bit about the edge and how that makes SD-WAN an imperative. And then I'm going to ask uh, Mike Rivers to talk to us a little bit about why many of the current WAN architectures uh, aren't ready for the cloud and distributed applications that are served from many, many locations. And then we'll take a look at some potential solutions around uh, how we re-architect the WAN, what are options for architectures. We do have some real use cases uh, from uh, enterprises that have deployed with success. We will give our sponsor, GTT, a few minutes to talk about their offer, and then we'll wrap it up with a short uh, conclusion. And with that, let me jump into the section that, around the multi-cloud. So to give everyone a little bit of context, you know, cloud, cloud computing is really not a new concept at this point. We've been talking about the cloud for over 10 years, although the cloud itself, in terms of what it can do, has changed dramatically uh, in the recent years because of advances in technology. When one first thought about the cloud, there was always this, let's call it nirvana state of wanting to be able to do something called cloud bursting, which is dynamically move workloads into the cloud to take advantage of compute by the minute when you needed it. We'd also be able to have a stable farm of compute uh, on premise for your workloads that ran every day 24 seven with constant CPU draw. Now that actually took us 10 years to implement because uh, the technology just wasn't there for us to have uh, our application stacks that were compatible between the cloud and what was on-prem and have management interfaces that allowed us to move workloads 
from the on-premise data center to the off-premise data center. Well, it turns out that in the 2015 time range, we actually achieved that and started to deploy architectures that people were referring to as hybrid clouds. Now, it wasn't too long after that that people realized that, oh my, cloud service providers are rather differentiated. The same reason we would go to Amazon isn't the same reason we'd use Google or Microsoft Azure, or if we look at the SaaS side of things, why we might use salesforce.com versus other options such as PeopleSoft from Oracle. And so it turned out that uh, enterprises started to compute and use many different applications building something we call the Meta Cloud. And the Meta Cloud was really a collection of places that enterprises would compute without any coordination. So issues of course happened because cost overruns that were unexpected occurred, enterprises didn't get the performance they wanted, and very clearly the market realized that something better was required. And then we moved on to start to build multi-clouds, which are still where the enterprise computes in multiple locations and uses many SaaS applications, but it's done in a managed way where we need to provide uh, high quality interconnectivity. And uh, as we'll see soon, that's where SD-WAN starts to play a very important role. Now, a lot of people might be saying, oh, come on, this is just marketing hype around the multi-cloud. And what I can share with you is some results from our latest edge connectivity survey where we survey enterprise and the respondents we surveyed told us that already in 2018, when the survey was done, they were using 10 different cloud service providers for SaaS and 10 different for infrastructure providers. And they expect that to grow over the next two years. And I can tell you that this result, if it's surprising to you, is actually very consistent as I've been asking this question now for four years in a row, and every year the now numbers is continually growing. So it is real, the multi-cloud is happening now, and the requirement for managing all of that is already in play. Now, let, if we go back to basics, we always have to keep in mind what is driving WAN bandwidth. And that's another question we asked our respondents, what is the traffic drivers that are making your WAN more important and causing you grief because you're having to buy more bandwidth. Well, believe it or not, 52% of respondents said that was data storage and backup. And that's actually quite consistent with uh, our tracking of cloud services as data storage is one of the top cloud services and usually one of the first that enterprises reach out to purchase. After that, the uh, Respondents said cloud-based services as SaaS or infrastructure as a service was right behind data storage and backup. And believe it or not, our very uh, well-known voice communication application is right there with cloud-based services. And so even though many of us might think that the cloud is about data, it actually, uh, and the WAN is about data, the voice must not be ignored. And in fact, many cases we see voices now serve from a hosted scenario requiring uh, putting more pressure on the WAN. Last but not least was handling just ordinary traffic to the website requiring more WAN bandwidth. And also something to, to keep an eye on is that 46% of respondents said they what was putting pressure on the WAN was access to on-premise applications in on-premise DCs. And so one thing I wanted to impress upon everyone is when we think of the multi-cloud, we must be clear that on-premise data centers are part of the multi-cloud. Okay, I do have some other responses here because the multi-cloud is a multifaceted element and there are many architectures that the WAN has to be able to support when it comes to cloud services. And what we have is 30% of respondents told us that by 2020, they will see be deployed in a multi-cloud architecture. That's up from last year's survey significantly. So a good, a good growth in terms of number of respondents that will be deploying that architecture. After that, the next important architecture is hybrid cloud. 
and 49% of our respondents said they will be in a hybrid cloud architecture by 2020. Many of them actually already are. Other common architectures that are in play are private cloud, that could be on-prem, that could be served by a cloud service provider offering a non-shared infrastructure in their data center, and public cloud. Public cloud, of course, is no surprise. It was one of the first out the gate and uh, it does see the widest adoption by respondents. I can assure you that SD-WAN is right now in its largest growth phase as it penetrates the mainstream enterprise. And results from our survey also show that. And also, we've been tracking the SD-WAN market now for five years. We're in discussions with all the major service providers. We're in discussions with most of the SD-WAN vendors. And we see a lot of correlation around where the market is going, how SD-WAN started as potentially a cost avoidance uh, play and has now become much, much more important. And we see that by the end of 2019, 52% of respondents said they would be in live production with SD-WAN, up from in the 20% range by 2018. And production trials are already well underway within the mainstream market. So we, we actually do have a forecast and we see that 2019 is really the year that SD-WAN goes into the mainstream and gets deployed. So with that, I'd like to ask uh, my colleague, Mike Rivers, to help us understand why some of the current WANs are not ready for the challenge. Thanks very much, Cliff, and uh, hello, everyone. So Mike Rivers here from GTT. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the way that innovation and changes in technology are being adopted within within the, uh, the the mainstream, should we say? The pace of adoption is significantly changing, and we can see from this uh, this graphic here and the information below that, that uh, for example, television took twenty eight years before it reached fifty percent of worldwide adoption. The internet took approximately a third of that time and Facebook in turn a third of that. So we're seeing that there is a significant shift in the way that users uh, are, are adopting technology, in the way that the demands for technology are, are changing. And this is something that we're seeing as, uh, as essentially the next industrial revolution, the new industrial revolution, if you like. It's having as much of an impact on us and uh, we will see such significant changes through this a very key phase in, in, in the development of technology that um, the impact is significant for corporate survivability. We can see that uh, down to Harvard Business Review that corporate survivability has reduced from 90% to 63%. And this is all due to the change that we're seeing in, in the world, uh, largely driven from technology. But that in turn has a significant impact on the network. New applications stress the de designs, cloud connectivity is more important, and fundamentally, the legacy telecom industry has not kept pace. So what do we mean by all this? Well, applications, as we've already discussed, are no longer primarily in the data center. There is a wholesale shift of applications through infrastructure as a service and software as a service, um, into, into cloud-based technologies. So slowly and steadily, we're seeing data and applications leaking out to cloud-based infrastructures. And we can see here that the quote at the top of the, a company having agreed a cloud-first strategy, um, the, the WAN isn't designed for that. The, the WAN is not designed to, to access the cloud. It's designed to connect offices. And I need a network that keeps pace with these changes. And we always see these, these very typical challenges in the market that people are after cost-effective solutions, ease of adoption, they need security, but they always have the, the challenges of shrinking budgets and, uh, and performance of applications being quite variable when they're accessing cloud technologies. 
So if we start to look at the legacy WAN architecture, and this is a, a, a little bit of an explanation of that, well, the traditional WAN, the traditional network was very straightforward. It was designed to connect offices to data centers. We'd probably see a lengthy RFP for a data center that needed to be a tier three facility. It wouldn't be on a floodplain. It wouldn't be under a flight path. It should have ease of access for engineers. It should have good connectivity. And there's a huge list of requirements that would typically go out in a, a data center RFP. And then the network was used to, to connect effectively and at lower latency as possible to those data centers. But as we've discussed, the applications have started to leak out to the cloud. The data is now, <coughs> excuse me, is, is elsewhere. And we typically see that the, the bandwidth now being consumed between um, corporate firewall the, and, and the internet for these applications now represents something in the region of typically 50 to 80% of all of that bandwidth is typically to access some form of cloud-based service as opposed to basic web services. Now, as a result of this, we have a, a complex security policy as well. We end up with a single firewall or a few firewalls scattered around the network, which have complex rule bases and typically we have big iron upgrades of those devices to move to the next generation. Um, and, and it's not a cost effective or easy thing to do. So what is SD-WAN? Well, and, and why are cl clients looking for it? Well, the drivers are, are, are straightforward enough. And I think this is where we, where we need to lean back on Cliff so he can talk to us a bit about this. Well, thanks, Mike. And actually, this is results from uh, another one of our surveys where instead of asking respondents about what were the bandwidth drivers on the WAN, we now specifically asked, okay, for those of you that are looking at SD-WAN, what are the reasons that you are? And uh, what they told us was they needed to improve performance of application delivery across the WAN. They weren't able to get the right um, quality of service to their end users, be it partners, be it employees. And it was just negatively impacting their business. So that was, that was very much the top SD-WAN driver, make it work better. The other element was that they found that as the bandwidth was being scooped up by applications, they still had a lot of WAN uh, capacity that was underutilized, but had to worry about peaks and couldn't well could, couldn't do a good job of balancing the use of the capacity they were paying for. And they were looking for SD-WAN to improve that utilization characteristic. Another very important uh, requirement was simplify WAN provisioning, eliminate the potential requirement for a skilled person to go on site and uh, do maintenance at a branch office or set up a branch office, and also, you know, do the continuous loop monitoring of, of how the performance was going at a branch office or a remote location, recognize something was wrong, and, potential, and potentially help with fixing that, or at least alerting. And then the other elements were try to automate even the human side as much as possible in the sense of offering a self-serve management portal where perhaps people at a branch office or remote sites could go in and adjust certain characteristics on their own uh, was another requirement. And uh, the, I think the last one I actually spoke to was around the rapid site provisioning. So those were the top drivers that the respondents to our survey told us were what they wanted. And with that, I think uh, I'm going to pass it back to Mike to talk a little bit about some of the architectural options that SD-WAN brings to the table in terms of uh, helping with these problems. Yes, thanks, Cliff. So at a high level, there are multiple features for SD-WAN technology and SD-WAN architecture. But um, some of the key components of it, I think, especially for the enterprise business that's migrating into this, this uh, SD-WAN world is uh, fundamentally it's hybrid technology, combining the best of both worlds with optimal access for both 
internet and MPLS or private networking performance. It's not typical for most businesses to, to have exclusively public-based applications or exclusively private-based applications. So therefore, the hybrid cloud and multi-cloud infrastructure needs hybrid and multi-cloud SD-WAN technology. The next piece I would talk about, it would be the application intelligence. The, the network needs to now understand the applications and route traffically dynamically based on the business priority for that application. So the ability to inspect the data that is passing over the network, understand what the application is, understand how that relates to its importance to the business, and understand how that relates to the performance of the underlying network, and that's the intelligence of the application intelligence. We talk about investment utilization as well. So backup circuits would typically be in an in a MPLS world would be essentially used as an insurance policy. It's a very expensive way of uh, providing a, a backup capability. And we're looking to extend that uh, uh, investment's use into something that can be used in production. So with a, a decent SD-WAN technology, those circuits can be actively utilized to increase the throughput and improve your user experience. And the next piece I'd like to talk about would be control. So the ability to modify applications and corresponding priorities. We talked about the application intelligence, but these things are directly linked. So the ability to control and steer policies and traffic based on the priorities for the business. And finally, network quality. So network quality in terms of the applications that are being accessed. Applications are either sat within a private network or a public network, as we typically say. When we're talking about public networking, we want to avoid budget bandwidth, which is where we're delivering bandwidth, which is at the rock bottom cost, but comes with higher risks in terms of availability, service levels, and so on. So we need to have quality underlying IP networking in order to effectively deliver the services that we're trying to achieve. So in terms of the technical features, well, what is SD-WAN? Well, there's two very key components. One is overlay networking. This is access agnostic. It uses all of the circuits, that are the IP circuits that are connected to it um, that are available to it. It doesn't really matter whether that service is being used uh, over LTE, whether it's a broadband circuit, it's fiber, um, or any other kind of circuit that you might have delivered. This is access agnostic. It doesn't really mind. It aggregates the bandwidth. It combines all of the circuits that are delivered to that site into one, um, into one logical domain, essentially. And it encrypts it. We're well, talking about encryption of all of the circuits again. So this is typically AES-256 as a standard. And it becomes hybrid capable as a native capability. So the network turns into one logical domain of public and private networking with encryption over the top. So it becomes far more than the sum of its parts. And it's application centric. We've talked about it previously. It understands the individual applications. It needs to be policy based on the applications. It adapts in real time. So the performance of any application can be steered and redirected down the best performing path. So that might in some cases mean that uh, a public, uh, a public uh, cloud service might actually get routed over a private networking service that you might have to a site simply because the performance at any given point in time would be better or better in line with the business policies that have been applied to the control mechanisms. And finally, finally visibility and control. Um, <clears throat> SD-WAN starts to inter introduce an awful lot more visibility into the performance of both the network and the applications and how those applications perform over the network. So we can really start to see the value that is being derived from the underlying network and the importance of the uh, applications that are being delivered over that network and correlating the two. 
So I wanted also to talk a little bit about network latency and its impact on application performance. So this is some data that I've taken from uh, a guy called Mike Belshi, who works at Google. And he essentially did a study to see how the performance of the Google application uh, was for the typical user in North America. And at the time of the study, the average latency was around 60 milliseconds for the average user trying to perform a search on the Google search engine. So what he did was he tested a series of different bandwidths for a 60 millisecond link to the Google application and produce the HTTP load times for the page. And as you can see, these load times are in seconds. But um, the most important thing here is that increasing the bandwidth had very little impact on, uh, on improving the application's performance. So as uh, any good scientist will typically do, they'll do a different test. They'll invert the test. And in this case, the test was inverted to keep the, uh, uh, the, the bandwidth as a fixed level, but this time altering the latency. And as you can see, there is a direct correlation between latency and the performance of these HCP load times. <coughs> Excuse me. So the conclusion was that reducing latency has a significant impact on improving application performance. And based on this data, various decisions were taken in terms of re-architecting the solution to improve the user's performance in, our, in accessing the search engine. So let's move on a little bit and talk about the application-centric one. How do we bring all of these things together? Well, we're starting to connect multiple sites, whether that be the offices or the data center, over multiple links. With here, we have the green and the gray representing internet and private networks into a single SD-WAN backbone. So this is a single logical domain, as we've discussed, which encrypts and secures the traffic and is access agnostic. And then from that, we have direct access to cloud-based applications, and we can directly send traffic securely to the application without having to, tra to traverse a centralized firewall, which would be typically located in the data center. We're no longer constraining the bandwidth between the data center and the internet, specifically for pushing all of the traffic to the cloud applications from users. But one of the big considerations is that we start to change our security architectures, where we're starting to push security policy to the edge, where it would be centrally managed, rather than having a single central firewall, as would be a traditional network design. So bringing the whole thing together and understanding the, the key components, well, we need to realize that there's more than just the SD-WAN technology. We need to understand how is the cloud integrated into the SD-WAN backbone that is being delivered? What is the, the networking tech capabilities in terms of tier one service, in terms of direct access to uh, internet-based services? whether we have the skills and technical exper expertise in place to deliver this, and what does the access network look like? We speak to a lot of clients who are looking to procure networking uh, services and access services themselves, but um, that can be quite a complicated journey, journey, and bringing this all together becomes a difficult task in reaching the business outcomes that are looking to be achieved from an SE1 uh, agenda. So moving on, I think Cliff is going to ask us a poll question. Yes, thank you, Mike. And uh, I think it's time for us to ask the audience what, uh, where they are in terms of their understanding of SD-WAN and what would be the reasons that they would uh, invest in SD-WAN. So what we're asking you to do is take a look at the list and check those that apply to you. I would suggest each person check, feel free to check the top two or three that most uh, reflect what would be the factors in their decision to invest in your WAN and potentially going to SD-WAN. 
And while we're giving the audience uh, a second to complete that task, uh, it would not surprise me to see a couple of these at a high level, and I, I'm not going to bias the audience by saying exactly which ones, but I have two favorites, and I'm going to uh, let you know what they were, what they are in another second as I'm going to flip the switch. So my top favorites are security and uh, the adoption of off-premise cloud services. So we'll see how I do. And the adoption of off-premise cloud services came to the top. However, security was uh, ooh, a little bit near the, well, actually, uh, reliability is the highest one at 59%, excuse me, I'm just looking at the numbers, and then followed by um, adoption of off-premise cloud services and security. So very good, and interestingly, traffic growth did come in lowest, although uh, not that much lower. So it looks like reliability is definitely a top driver for investing in the WAN and getting to a better state of application delivery performance. Interest, very interesting result. And what I wanted to share with you was um, result from, again, another survey that we've done where we asked uh, enterprise respondents, how would you like to consume SD-WAN going forward? And the large blue uh, line is how they're doing it today. And so it's a mix of standalone, a standalone managed service or self-managed hardware and software on site. And we see that by 2019, sometime next year, well, this year now, a year later since the survey was done, or it will be a year in the fall of 2019, that the, the, the respondents want to move away from those two options and move more to a managed service bundle that includes other services uh, such as web application firewall, perhaps certain security service, other security services, perhaps load balancing and connectivity. So uh, respondents are telling us that as the market matures, they want to be able to have their choice of services bundled with SD-WAN. And so with that, we're going to go and take a look at a couple of use case examples. But before we do that, I want to share one more bit of results from our survey. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk about actual use cases. And I know everyone's anxious to hear about the use cases, so I won't take too, too long. But we did ask uh, enterprises, what would be their top criteria for selecting not only a vendor, but the solution? And the top criteria was, could they feel confident that the solution they were putting in was secure. After that, it was reliability. So you could see I already knew some data and was making a guess about how the audience would react in the poll question. It turns out that people on the uh, poll question were a little bit different than our survey results. After that, performance was really important. Of this, And so how much did the solution improve performance of application delivery? And then after that, the fourth in line was pricing. So was it all affordable after they got, after the respondents got all of the performance, reliability, and security they wanted? And finally, was the right, did, can they rely on the vendor or the provider to provide the right level of service support? Okay, well, with that, let me turn it over to uh, Mike, and we can talk about some real use cases, something I believe everyone's really wanting to hear about. Okay, thanks, Cliff. So, um, <clears throat> sorry, I've got a little bit of a cough here. I um, wanted to talk about this first use case, which is um, for a global manufacturer uh, with uh, nearly, well, approaching 100 locations that are spread across Europe, North America, and Asia. Um, and uh, their challenges were really about focusing on gaining competitive advantage using the IoT capabilities, very much about uh, providing their customers uh, in the, uh, actually in the uh, um, cleaning space here, um, with uh, capabilities of using IoT within their devices to provide more intelligence in their services and more intelligence and capabilities for, the, for their users. But that meant increasing demands and reliance on the network. They had heavy adoption of cloud, and I think 
This is very, very typical in the manufacturing sector. We see most of our manufacturing clients are heavy adopters of cloud. Um, but they also needed to protect against security of data uh, and whilst having an inefficient networking design. And we can see here it's very much uh, uh, in line with some of the things that we talked about previously, centralized firewalls, centralized traditional MPLS, branch offices, and breaking out to the cloud through that, uh, that centralized data center capability. So how did we change this? Well, of course, the answer is SD-WAN, which you'd expect on an SD-WAN focused webinar. But uh, we saw significant improvements with this, this, uh, this change. The mix of access technologies provides lower latency to the applications that are being used. So we have a faster path to those cloud-based applications through broadband or um, dedicated internet access circuits, which means that the SD-WAN service the SD-WAN intelligence understands that that is the better performing path for those applications and therefore utilizes that underlying network. But the hybrid nature of the networks also simplified the adoption of um, cloud as well, because this means that uh, the capability to move applications from being in the data center to in the cloud became more straightforward. It's no longer a complicated um, uh, setup that needs to be put in place. There's simply a policy that gets pushed out in terms of the location of those applications. Um, in this case as well, we saw cost-effective bandwidth being implemented with uh, broadband services, so reducing the, uh, the cost per meg um, for, for regional sales offices where we've pushed out uh, lower cost access circuits, but still integrated them into a high performance network. We've seen encryption of data across the, across the estate. So moving away from a, an MPLS network with unencrypted traffic to a SE-WAN network using a multi, multiple access technologies and full encryption. And of course, um, full uh, project management and service delivery by uh, GTT. And if we move on to a, a second use case, <clears throat> this is for a, a, a healthcare organization that are based in the States. Um, not of a, a, a huge size, 15 sites in Florida, but also 12 sites from a, a recent acquisition. So this is um, it's essentially two organizations in the same sector that uh, delivered their networking services in a very similar manner. Again, traditional MPLS networks, but the challenges here were very much about integration and again, security and compliance. When we're talking about medical data. There are very uh, strict rules and regulations, uh, HIPAA compliance in terms of making sure that, uh, um, that they're, they're in line with the, the needs of the, that uh, market and, and that sector. Um, we've also got uh, significant oversubscription of links database backups and synchronization of data between sites could saturate the links, impacting user performance. So effectively, you've got two networks here, traditional designs trying to work together as one and essentially pushing the boundaries of their capability. Notice that this is not strictly a cloud-based uh, use case, but obviously the client will have been adopting some cloud services as well. And as we start to um, see the change, this is the transition into the uh, working solution. Well, we saw synergies obtained through a single managed MPLS backbone at the, at the, uh, as, as part of this component. Uh, and we had compliance achieved through separation of uh, management of the guest Wi-Fi. Something I didn't really point out earlier was that uh, the client um, had a significant demand to provide uh, guest Wi-Fi in their sites, but providing that access and that separated breakout uh, in a secure manner with a separate network was a challenge for them. We also saw productivity increase through higher speed transport links. Excuse me, through higher speed transport links. Okay, 
And as we move on to GTT's solution, so GTT's solution introduces cloud networking as part of the core of the backbone, where we have reliable and performant applications and will reduce the risk of cloud adoption. This is where GTT's backbone really comes into play. And we see the direct integration to the major cloud providers as a key component and a key tenant of the, uh, uh, of the overall SD-WAN solution. Private network options, assured services, and global coverage. Furthermore, the leading Tier 1 global backbone capability means that we have the highest priority QoS and direct access to more internet locations than almost any other provider, with lower latency offering better performance. We see the internet as being the future of networking and very much the network that is of most relevance to applications today. And therefore, the Tier 1 global backbone has more relevance today than ever before. Access and reach. GCT can connect anywhere around the world. With over 3,500 access network providers, that means that we can get into difficult to, to reach areas, difficult to reach countries, and offer a range of access technologies, whether that be broadband, Ethernet, LTE. It doesn't really matter. It's a balance of cost and risk and ability to deliver the service and get it turned up fast. And finally, managed services experience. We have a lot of capability in terms of delivering managed services, and we look to accelerate the business outcomes without the cost and complexity of trying to glue and, and uh, all of these components together as a, as a business and as a project yourself. We support over two, 200,000 devices currently under management. So I'm going to hand over to Cliff to uh, wrap up with some conclusions, and then we'll move to Q&A. Thank you, Mike. And um, what I wanted to do was share with the audience uh, some thoughts and some last results from a, a survey we did where we compared respondents that were using traditional WAN architectures with the needs of respondents uh, that had already started deploying SD-WAN. And the results were, were quite interesting. What we found was that for uh, SD-WAN deploying respondents, they are much more geographically dispersed than their uh, respond in the respondents that were using um, traditional architectures. Now, it turns out they had roughly the same number of sites, but on average had 30% less employees. They also had approximately twice the proportion of remote and mobile employees. So, so quite a difference between those that have deployed SD-WAN to date and those that maybe have, are still using traditional WAN architectures. Other elements that we noticed that were different between respondents uh, measured by various metrics were that the number of sites uh, for SD-WAN respondents was expected to increase by 14% throughout 2019 as compared to only 4% for those still on traditional WAN architectures. The deployment bandwidth for SD-WAN respondents was growing at nearly twice the rate of, of the non-SD-WAN respondents. And, the, and, their, and their WAN expenditures were growing seven times the rate of the WAN respondents. We also saw that SD-WAN deploying respondents were embracing a very strong cloud-based application delivery strategy and, one, and moving more aggressively with IoT as an application. So quite a, quite a, set, a separation in the market for those that are adopting SD-WAN today and perhaps on the cusp of doing it compared to those that are still sitting with traditional WAN architectures based upon our, our research. So with that, I'm actually going to open the floor to Q&A and we've already had some great questions come in. However, there's still time to add 
more questions as we have about 15 minutes left in the discussion. And I think I'm going to pick one of the questions that came in uh, for Mike to get started. If uh, And uh, with that, I think one of the high priority questions was uh, a very common question we get uh, about SD-WANs complementing or replacing MPLS and also thoughts on a migration path. You know, how much can enterprises save when they move from dedicated circuits to uh, managed IP services leveraging the public internet? So lots of good uh, fertile elements for, for you to help the audience understand, Mike. Yeah, sure. So this is um, a very common question, as you say. Um, I think the, the, the first answer is, um, can SD, in, in regards to the high level, can SD-WAN replace MPLS? The answer is, that from a client perspective, yes. Uh, MPLS as, as a technology is actually a, really is a, a backbone capability that is used within provider networks. Now, many providers still use MPLS as part of a, a, a network backbone, but um, delivering MPLS services and circuits to client sites shouldn't necessarily be um, the essential part of the SD-WAN service. Fundamentally, uh, an SD-WAN can replace a uh, private network using MPLS from a client perspective. But um, I guess the questions are more about what are the outcomes that are looking to be achieved um, and what are the benefits that are looking to be achieved. MPLS services versus SD-WAN services um, are, are very different because the fundamental costs are generally to do with the access circuits and whether that's be a private network access circuit or a public access network circuit and the risks and the performances associated with those. So we do have many clients who have SD-WAN with us who are simply using internet services and no hybrid networking at all as part of their solution. And that's very much, I think, an end state as, uh, as, as clients migrate away. But as an interim path, we expect that most clients will adopt a hybrid solution where they have MPLS and public internet-based services with a slow transition over the, over the period uh, of a, perhaps a, a traditional term to, to essentially switch the bandwidth, the aggregate bandwidth from MPLS to internet. As, as applications and traffic changes. When we start to talk about a cost perspective, the circuit types, the access circuit types also vary, um, vary significantly with geographies, regions, with the North American market and the European market looking very different. Fundamentally, uh, an, uh, an access network port, whether it be an MPLS port or an internet port, in some regions of the world are almost identical in costs where in other regions, they're vastly different. So it depends on the network backbone itself. Well, thanks, Mike. We have a question here about Edge. So I'm going to kick that off, and then I'm going to give you a chance to ask you to add anything you might like to. And so the question is, how does SD-WAN support Edge computing for everything from IoT devices to image recognition, connected vehicles, and everything else? And I guess we could look at the world of the connected world, the wired world, where it'll be, I think, mostly about prioritizing traffic and making sure, and understanding what traffic gets priority on the WAN. When it comes to the mobile world, we have a, we hear a lot of discussion about the concept of network slicing in 5G. That is actually physically slicing. Uh, tranches of the bandwidth and allocating that. But then even within those slices, something has to allocate the, steer the applications to the right slice. And that's where we think SD-WAN is going to play a very important role. Uh, Mike, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that around the edge discussion. Yeah, I think, um, you know, edge as a, as a, as a whole capability and IOT is, is going to significantly change the way that services are delivered. I think that we'll start to see a demand for uh, much lighter weight, lower cost SD-WAN capabilities in order to integrate with IoT style devices um, to, 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 to enhance and improve the overall security of the IoT message 
and capabilities around that. But um, obviously for an IoT device that consumes virtually no bandwidth at all, um, the, the cost and the uh, access mechanisms around that needs to be seriously considered, as well as the SD-WAN technology as we evolve into that space. Um, another question for you specifically for GTT. Where there's a lot of the people on the line are from different verticals. And you know, verticals like to know there are others like themselves that are implementing. Uh, can you highlight what are the top three or four verticals that you, you've been getting traction with, with SD-WAN? Yeah, of course, certainly. So our, um, we, we see an awful lot of success in the uh, manufacturing sector. Um, we have some significant customers in, in manufacturing uh, with global footprints. Uh, and, and the other one, which is I think is quite the, quite an obvious one, is is retail markets, um, where we see the ability to spin up services quite quickly, the ability to use lower cost bandwidth um, is very much aligned with retail. So we have quite a few clients in the retail se sector as well, with uh, lots of uh, lots of should we say lower bandwidth sites. Uh, um, in order to address that. And then in, in the middle, we see things like um, services sector um, quite significantly, uh, people like lawyers, uh, law firms, and, and, and so on, um, getting, getting quite heavily involved in, in SD-WAN. And I think uh, in, in their cases, that's uh, largely due to, uh, again, adoption of cloud technologies um, for, for peripheral applications that they, they, they work with. So um, it's uh, interesting, I think, as well, within that sector, there's an awful lot of M&A um, work, so lots of acquisitions, meaning that there is the, the, the demand to integrate multiple uh, networks effectively into one. And SD-WAN enables that quite such, in a straightforward way. You know, and we keep, I keep getting the same question here a couple of times around cost. So oh, I know you can't say specifically how much will someone save, how much will an enterprise save, but can you give us a range of the different, uh, of the savings that you may have seen with implementations to date, if there is a cost saving component to it? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a really difficult one to nail down. And the reason why is that almost every single, in almost every single case, clients are moving from their existing network to a new network. Um, and in terms of the client's budget for that, yes, budgets are typically shrinking, but we see it's very common for the approach for network buyers to be quite simply that they're going to spend their budget on, on the network. And that generally means that they, are, they rather than reducing the total overall cost of their WAN, what they're looking to do is add features and add capabilities. So the introduction of uh, more security capabilities. So uh, we see clients looking to push next gen firewalls to all of their edge locations, whereas previously they would have uh, used uh, perhaps a, a centralized firewall. Um, they, they, rather than using just a basic firewall at a site, which we also offer, uh, they'd look to implement a next gen firewall they also might look at optimization techniques and fundamentally the most interesting one to clients is increasing bandwidth. So uh, a network is not typically static. So there isn't really a single number that I can give you in terms of cost reductions, but I think generally speaking, clients are getting a lot more for the same kind of spend. Okay, um, I think we should come back around security and a question for you is, what do you tell clients that are looking to deploy SD-WAN to take security as a barrier off the table? Yeah, okay, so that's, a, that's a, 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 an interesting one. I mean, of course, there are always security, security concerns, there are always new attack vectors, but um, certainly when comparing to traditional MPLS networks, Traditional MPLS networks are not um, encrypted. They're not secured in that manner. They're essentially a private network, 
which uh, with the theory being that uh, because it's separated and private, that your traffic is secure. Uh, I think with SD-WAN, essentially, we, we, we take that kind of a step further. We can deliver it over a private network, but we can also encrypt it end to end um, between all of the endpoints that we deliver on, a, on an SD-WAN network. And that can be with AES-256, for example, which is very much uh, the, the industry standard of about the highest level of encryption that uh, would sensibly be used. Um, beyond that, we start to see introductions of uh, other security vectors, perhaps uh, uh, policies in terms of governance and, and control and who has access to, to, to data, which are all different questions. But we can look at locking down and restricting the access to those data and using things like encryption keys, which are only available to a limited number of employees. So it very much becomes a secure platform for delivering packets between various different locations on and off the network. All right, wow, you're getting grilled. There's lots of questions here. The, a, a kind of related question security is monitoring. And the question we're getting is, you know, how does GTT interact with their customers as you know, you provide SD-WAN connectivity, but you might not be supporting applications residing in the cloud or on-prem. And is there, so I guess the question is, when you do that kind of monitoring, do you get this kind of breakdown where it's still very hard to understand what's gone wrong? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is should we say, the double-edged sword that is uh, SD-WAN's rich reporting and, and uh, and, and monitoring, you know, which is suddenly there's an awful lot more data. And uh, um, to, to some extent, it becomes almost like the security world when SIEM came along and there was security event management um, was something that was very much in demand. Yes, the technologies that we deploy enable a much more simplified view. So the ability to uh, drill down into data and understand what's going on on a per application level is there and we enable our clients to to have a full visibility of that but if there's if there's more than that that's required this is where service management can can start to provide uh, additional functionality over the top where uh, we essentially uh, take a, a subject matter expert from within the business to provide a, more of a detailed analysis of what's going on within the client's network. Okay, well, I think we have room for time for one more question I'm being told. And um, I think the, there's so many here, I'm having a hard time to choose. Uh, I think the question I, I we maybe want to go with something a little more technical is you know is SD WAN able to address protocols or more pro robust protocol issues like multicast to help uh, leverage you know integration with uh, routers and elements like that. Huh? That's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, I think we probably need a, um, a little bit more um, context around that, and I'd certainly want to lean on um, our, our, our architecture and engineering department to, to understand that that further. But um, we can pick that one up uh, offline and, uh, and respond to that one directly. Okay, well, in that case, uh, I think we're just near the top of the hour, and I'm gonna pass it back to Alan for a few closing remarks. Thank you for all the hard work, uh, Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff, and thank you, Mike, for joining us today on our webinar. I also want to thank all of you for attending as well, participating, and for submitting all those questions and comments. Uh, we will get back to you. There are a large number of questions that came in, so our panel will be following what, up with you directly. Again, thank you to Cliff for leading our webinar and Mike for being on board and sharing your expertise with us today. So an archived version of this webinar will be made available shortly, so feel free to come back 
view this session again, or perhaps even share it with uh, some of your colleagues. Now you will see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of our webinar. We'd love to get your feedback. So please take a few moments to fill that out. And lastly, please continue to follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter for more information on future IHS Market Technology Group webinars. So again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.